Welcome to On Record PR, where we go on record with industry leaders to discuss best practices for public relations strategies that drive business success. Let's get started with the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of On Record PR. I'm your host, Gina Rubel, and the founder of Furia Rubel Communications. Today, we're going on record with Sarah Merkin, legal reporter with Reuters. Sarah primarily writes for a subscriber audience of lawyers and other professionals, covering a variety of legal topics, including privacy and data security, the business of law, and legal innovation and technology. She joined the Reuters legal team in April of 2020. And in addition, she has worked as a reporter at Bloomberg Law and Bloomberg BNA. In the transcript of this, I'll have a link to what she covers, so you can go right to all of her articles. And with that, I would like to welcome you, Sarah. Great. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to have you here. What's it like to be on the other side of the interview? <laughs> yeah, definitely a, dip- a different feeling. I don't do this very often. <laughs> well, we really appreciate it. And I know our listeners appreciate it because having access and a better understanding of the industry of law reporters is very helpful for our audience. So thank you. Yeah, it's great. So how did you become a legal reporter at Reuters? Yeah, so I have been a legal reporter from the get-go. When I was in college, I was studying journalism as my major. And for a summer internship, I worked on the legal news division in Bloomberg BNA. And I joined Bloomberg BNA, Bloomberg Law, after I graduated college. I was there for a few years. And then I joined Reuters in April of 2020, you know, covering, covering the legal industry. I've been writing about privacy and data security for a few years and then kind of expanded my beat, took on, you know, the business of law, law firms, everything under the legal beat for about a year now. So do you like having a little bit more of a broad beat in reporting? I do. It's really allowed every day to be very different. I That's one of my favorite parts about my job. When I wake up each morning, you know, sometimes I know what I'll be writing about. Sometimes I don't, but it's it's always very different kinds of stories. So I appreciate that. So it's interesting. I mentioned uh, in the beginning that I was going to put a link to your articles, which is on the Reuters website. And I counted about 15 articles in the last eight business days. (laughs) Sounds about right. You're doing about two full feature stories a day. Yeah, it it can it can be that way. Wow. Sometimes three, sometimes one. It varies, but usually a few a day. Wow. Wow. So, you know, if we have any students listening (laughs) who want to go into journalism, it's a lot of writing. (laughs) Now, I think that's fantastic. And it it begs the question about what your typical day looks like. So could you share a little bit of that with us? Yeah, definitely. And like I said, every day is a little bit different. So, you know, my Monday will be different from my Tuesday. But generally, you know, I I wake up, I am looking around for both news on the privacy and data security side and on the legal business side. So, you know, those are very different kinds of stories. So I'm I'm looking around pretty much everywhere. So I'm checking court filings to, you know, to look at what's been going on in litigation in the past day. I'm seeing if there has been any news, you know, any press releases from companies that I'm following or issues that I'm that I'm tracking. You know, I'm really just trying to get the pulse of, of what's going on across all of the beats. And, you know, like you noted, some days it's two stories, some days it's one, some days it's more. I'm also usually trying to work on a longer term piece at the same time. So in addition to writing stories in the day, I'm also trying to set up interviews with people for some of those longer term ideas. When do you sleep? <laughs> Get it. Yeah, it's, um, it gets to be a lot, but it's, it's all fun. And I really like having the balance of writing, interviewing, thinking about these ideas from a high level. It's its a good mix. So you mentioned that you look at court filings and press releases and obviously sources who are reaching out to you. Do you also monitor social media? I do. I'm, I'm on Twitter a lot. It's, it's usually in the background of, you know, what I'm doing because a lot of times I'll see something on Twitter before a press release or before you know, before someone reaches out. Not as much for court filings, those I'm usually more proactive about finding, but Twitter is a big one for finding news or just 
knowing what people are saying about the news that I also might be writing about. You know, people are talking about why this matters or what this means in the broader context. It's interesting. We try to get a lot of the older generation of lawyers to understand why Twitter is so important and how the media is engaging there. I think this statistic is 27% of the verified accounts on Twitter are members of the media. Yeah, that sounds about right. And so it's it's fascinating to me and it's it validates that. So I, I thank you for that because that <laughs> gives us that little piece of, yeah, you really should be there carefully. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, sometimes I'll see people post links to stories and sometimes their commentary in a tweet is, you know, it makes me think a little more about what's going on. It's not something that is written in the story. It's it's either someone on the outside commenting why they think it matters or what they think about it, or someone that wrote the story adding in tidbits that, you know, they couldn't make it in. So it's it's really good for everyone to be on. It really is. And it gives you that more broad view of different issues where you yeah. might not get that from just one source. Right. So what makes news worth covering? That's a good question. <laughs> I think, you know, that also kind of differs, you know, for everyone's beat, for everyone's kind of topic area. But for me, it's, you know, a lot of the time, something means more to me when I can see why it matters. Like my my understanding of, you know, the context of the news is the same thing that my readers also want. So, you know, there's, if I can see that something is part of a trend or part of a bigger story that generally grabs my attention more than, something where I can't see where it fits in in the broader space, if that makes sense. So, you know, when I'm talking with a law firm or a company about whatever type of news it is, it's actually more helpful if they kind of highlight this is part of a trend for us or this is the latest, you know, in a similar type of move because that shows me, you know, the bigger picture. And then I guess in terms of, you know, when I'm looking at court filings and the the privacy and data security space, Usually something is worth covering if it's, you know, a decision in a court case or, you know, it's a, it's a company or an issue that people care about or, you know, want to see what's going on there. Do you have any particular stories that you've written about that have become you know, favorites in any way, shape or form? <laughs> I'm trying to think. I don't know of any particular story, but I've been writing a lot recently about legal innovation and I have really started to add you know, more kinds of stories that I write about there. It's just a really interesting topic. And I find the people I I talk with in that space are, you know, very, I mean, everyone is usually passionate about what they do, but the people that are driving change in the industry are very forward looking. And the interviews are always really interesting because it's usually ideas that I either haven't heard about yet or they're being fleshed out more. So I've been writing a lot of interesting stories there. That's fantastic. And you know, for our listeners, who, most of whom will really understand what legal innovation is, but I just want to give it a definition. What does that mean to you? <laughs> well, that actually is a hard question because it means so many things to so many different people. On one hand, I think that means, you know, technology. You know, that means legal technology companies or, you know, within a law firm, that's, you know, how are we making our processes more efficient, both internally and for clients. So there's a lot of work being done by different firms, by different alternative service providers that are really trying to, you know, to drive change to make things more efficient or better in whatever way. It is a big conversation and trend, and I'll share with you, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but if you're ever looking for sources, the College of Law Practice Management um, has Mm -hmm. a directory on their website, and that's One of the biggest things uh, those of us who are fellows talk about on a regular basis. Yeah. You know, how do we make the industry better, more efficient, more client facing? Exactly. More transparent. So I throw that out there. And it wasn't a trick question. It was more for the audience to understand if you're not involved in legal innovation, why you should be. Yeah. And I think... You know, since there are so many components to it, I think that's part of what makes it so interesting for me to cover because, you know, when people reach out about different, you know, different companies or different law firms doing 
very different things, I'm always interested in, in hearing about it because it's not the same story over and over. It's, you know, I'm hearing from different people about really, really cool things. Have you seen any innovation as a result of the coronavirus pandemic that was particularly, and, and I'm not asking you to mention any, yeah. anyone you covered in particular, but any types of innovation that was particularly interesting or made a real difference in the industry? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it's a little hard for me to say because I only started covering this portion of the industry last summer. So I, I came into it during the pandemic. So I don't know. I mean, I know what existed before, but I, I wasn't writing about it as extensively. But most of what I've been writing about recently have been about things that maybe were already in the works before the pandemic. But now people say that, you know, the pandemic has fueled demand for these, you know, these efficiencies or these products because, you know, because most people were working from home. So there were a lot of, you know, online tools and online ways of working that, maybe lawyers and others didn't need to do before, but they realized that now that they are, it's it's making their lives better. So, you know, there's a lot of things where they might've existed before, but at least from what I'm hearing, they're, you know, maybe more important now. It's fascinating to me as a third generation attorney in my family and in the industry personally for almost 30 years, how quickly the pandemic changed the speed with which law firms adopt new technology right in comparison to pre-march 2020 right <laughs> it's just it's mind-blowing it's like the i can't say that they've come up to speed with the rest of the corporate world mm -hmm. but close to it yeah. um, in many respects and i say they we the legal industry in general is so much closer to being on par with the corporations and entities that they represent and understanding of how to use those technologies. I think that was a huge benefit as a result of the pandemic. Right, exactly. I mean, at least from what I'm, I'm hearing too, that's kind of what everyone says. They say, you know, there's been 10 years worth of, you know, innovation and change brought in the past, you know, past year. So it's definitely forced people to rethink the way that they're working. So what are some of the things that catch your attention in your email? If somebody wanted to send you a possible story, what would allow it to stand out from the many, many emails you get every day? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And something I actually think about when I choose to open an email or choose to respond to an email, I've, I've kind of thought about what that person did that made me respond. And I think for me, it's it's usually when something is more personal. I can tell that the person reaching out to me has either read my coverage before, um, has an understanding of a story that I would be interested in, and you know maybe maybe makes more of an effort rather than just sending you know the same block email that I can tell has been copy and pasted to 100 other journalists because you can tell in an email when something is personal or not. So generally, if it's if it's not personal, I probably won't respond, or if I do, it's because. I can tell that everyone else getting it is, you know, interested in covering it for the same reasons I am, but it really makes a difference to me when I can tell someone's reaching out to me or me and my colleagues because they know what we do and they know what we'd be interested in. So what makes something for Reuters, like why should somebody give an exclusive to Reuters over any of the other publications? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that honestly, Reuters is a very, very trustworthy news source. And I'm sure, of course, you can say that about a lot of news organizations because there are a lot of many very you know, trustworthy organizations. But the Reuters legal team has really you know, built up over the past year, you know, added a bunch of really great reporters. And we all have really deep expertise in the areas that we're covering. So you know, I think there's also the benefit of you know, the broader Reuters brand. You know, we're part of a very big global news organization, but then within that, the Reuters legal team is, I think everything that we cover is, you know, we're doing it for a reason. We're not just pumping out, you know, even though you, you may see us write a lot of stories today, we're not pumping out stories just to have stories. I think that we really have a focus on, you know, providing that context that I was talking about before, about why someone should be interested in reading this. And I know that's something that's been drilled into me. I don't want to write something if 
the people on the other side aren't going to be interested in what it is or if it's not going to help them do their job better. I think that we really just have a focus on bigger picture, you know, trying to bring in why this matters to our audience. So at Reuters, are you looking at readership data and how, you know, what people are reading, if they're sharing it, and is that informing some of the types of things you cover? So I don't know readership and I don't actually know if if the management knows that or, you know, how that all works behind the scenes. I look at what people talk about on Twitter. I see who's sharing the Reuters articles. It doesn't necessarily inform, you know, what I'm covering, but I do like to see if, you know, if people are talking about the stories that we're writing and and who's talking about it. It's, it's really cool to see when, you know, people at big law firms or people in government or people from wherever, you know, think that something that we're writing is important. So it's something I do take a look at, but I wouldn't say it informs what I cover. That's good to know. And I asked you what works in an email. What doesn't work? What is that thing? Like, just don't do this with me. (laughs) Well, I think that I understand it is, you know, the job of a, a, PR professional or others to, you know, to get journalists' attention when that makes sense. But it doesn't work for me when someone sends 15 follow-up emails when I haven't answered one of them. That, you know, that that generally isn't going to make me respond again. So that's something that I wouldn't say it bothers me, but, you know, sometimes I'll get five follow-up emails about the same thing that for whatever reason, I'm not interested in. Do you ever tell people that you're not interested or that, you know, you you just don't have space for that or? Yeah, I, I do when, so the emails that I don't ever respond to are the ones that it's not about something I'm writing about whatsoever. Right. You know, it's something that I was pulled off a press list that probably went to thousands of people and it doesn't even make sense for it to be coming to me. But for the ones where it does make sense to be coming to me, and I either just don't have the bandwidth that day because there are a lot of other things going on, or for whatever reason, I'm just not interested, I sometimes I'll forward those to my colleagues on my team because I'm not the only person covering the business of law. So, you know, I'll forward to other people to see if they're interested. Or if, you know, if it's just not something I can handle, I will respond and say, you know, I'd love to keep in touch in the future, but this isn't something I'm doing today. And I I like that. How do you feel about, you know, we've seen a little bit of a trend in PR where people send two reporters an email and say, I know you both cover this. I wanted to send it to you both in case one of you was interested. How do Mm -hmm. you feel about that approach? I'm totally, I'm good with that approach. I think sometimes, like I said, one person might be really tied up with with a lot going on that day, but the other person might not be. So uh, yeah, I have nothing against, you know, getting an email with, with several of my colleagues on it because chances are, you know, one person might be interested. Now, years ago, that was a no-no. You would never do that. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> and so it's interesting because everybody wanted the story first, but I think as the internet has taken over and we're in a 24-7, 365 news cycle, that people are more appreciative of, well, yeah, that might be a story, but there's just no way I'm getting to it today. Right. So it's something we've been doing more of, but we never know if it's, you know, I do know if it's somebody who's been a journalist for more than 20 years that I'm not going to do that. Right. That makes sense. (laughs) That makes sense. Maybe, yeah, I, I didn't know. Maybe other people have a problem with that, but I don't mind at all. I think it's, it's very generational. It's very generational, but it's interesting. And that's why I asked you, because I really want the listeners to get a sense of what works when reaching out to you so that you have new sources. Yeah. I would presume that a diversity of sources is important to you as well. Definitely. Yeah, it definitely is. That's something I pay attention to. And something I just thought of when you were talking, I would add that I always appreciate, you know, someone reaching out even when there isn't a story that day. So you know, to get in touch with sources for the future. That often works for me if, you know, someone from wherever, a law firm, a company, they say, hey, I've, you know, I saw that you covered X, Y, Z. We also do that. Or I, you know, I have someone that 
could talk about that in the future. They say, let me know if you're ever working on a story. And I usually, I'll keep that person in mind because it just introduces a new source to me, even if I'm not looking for them to comment in the next hour on on whatever kind of story. So um, I appreciate those and I, I keep those in mind when I'm thinking of sources for other stories. That's well, great to know. You know, you're going to get bombarded after this goes. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it because it, you know, I have the sources I have because of other stories I've written or pre-pandemic conferences I went to or, you know, all of those other ways of getting sources. But there are so many people out there that, of course, I've never talked to. So I'm I'm always interested in, you know, even just setting up an an email introduction. There doesn't have to be a call from the get-go, but um, just being introduced to someone via email really helps me too. That's great to know. So what are some of the legal trends on your radar? Yeah, it's, that's a big question because there's a lot going on right now. I guess something that I've been watching is some of the state regulatory reforms in Arizona and Utah that have that have been opening up, you know, different reforms for non non-lawyer ownership of law firms and other experimentation with legal services delivery models. Um, that's something I'm watching not only because it's already happening in two states, but because you know, I've heard and know that it's, you know, it's being considered in other states as well. So that's something that I've kept my eye on. Yeah, California has been considering this and a few others. I'm not sure what stages they're at just because it's kind of hard to keep up with some of the the smaller, you know, committee changes or, or things going on in different states. But that's a big one. That's been, there's been a lot of talk about that in the industry in the past few months. So what's interesting is I know that a lot of our my listeners, our listeners, They want to see the nomenclature change from non-lawyer to legal professional. Yeah. And because we don't call people non-doctors or non-dentists, non-anything. And have have you heard that as well? Have you, has that been a part of? Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up too. The reason I said non-lawyer is because that's what the states call it in their, in their orders and such, but the, the term non-lawyer and, you know, not using that term is actually something I've heard a lot about just in the past month. I, I know it's been, you know, talk about that for a while, but I, maybe I, I wasn't hearing about it recent, until recently. And yeah, that's something I've talked with, you know, people at professional service firms and law firms and others about because I can totally understand why someone would not want to be called a non-lawyer because they're just as you know, just as important to the business or the firm or wherever they're at. So that is a big topic I've been hearing about recently. It's fascinating. And I can tell you where it comes from. It comes from lawyers who wrote ethics rules. Right. And if you read the ethics rules, it says non-lawyer across the, you know, the ABA uses it in their model rules and all the states use them. So it's a problem in the industry because it is the nomenclature that was given in the rules of ethics. Right. And, you know, I I actually teeter on that because I am a lawyer and I am a practicing I practice in communications. Right. I I don't practice law. I'm a communications professional. And yet I served on an ethics committee for years. So I understand where the nomenclature comes from. Right. But I also more now than ever understand the importance of us trying to actually get the ethics committees and the lawyers to stop using it mm-hmm. because it doesn't reflect the value that professionals bring, especially if we're going to have professional ownership right, right. <laughs> of people who don't have a JD. So I just find it a fascinating conversation, even from that perspective. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I, I found it fascinating the first time. I think the first or one of the first times recently I remember hearing about it is, you know, a post on LinkedIn. I think someone, someone I wasn't connected with, but, you know, I I saw it on my feed for whatever reason, posted a story that had non-lawyer in the headline and said, you know, we should really get away from this. And it had, you know, hundreds of comments on the post. Maybe I I think it was one night I was bored. So I read through (laughs) all of them, (laughs) of course. And, you know, everyone was in agreement saying, yeah, we should really get away from this term. And I was like, huh, I probably have used the word non-lawyer in a headline, mostly because, as you mentioned, I'm talking about these ethics rules that have that in the 
you know, in the text. So it would make sense. Maybe we could get the industry to put it in quotes. Yeah. Yeah. That could, yeah, no. that could be helpful. Yeah. No, it's, it really made me think about my own writing because I said, yeah, I've, I've used that term, but now I'm thinking about it a little differently just, you know, based on that first LinkedIn post I saw, but then, you know, from others, you and, and others now that have brought it up. So it's something I've been paying attention to. Well, I can tell you it's a major part of our conversation in the Legal Marketing Association and the College of Law Practice Management because we want to change the value proposition of what professionals bring to the table. Right. So it's an interest it's an interesting point. And I couldn't help but ask yeah. as a part of the conversation. No, and then I appreciate it because it, you know, every time someone says it, it it reminds me and it makes me think about it too. So it's it's good to talk about. So are there any other tips or thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience about working with you or the legal media in general? Yeah, I guess, you know, let me think. I guess I'd say, you know, back to the point of, you know, being introduced to someone, even if I'm not writing about it that day. I think sometimes, you know, it's difficult if I want someone to comment for a story and my deadline is two hours from now. You know, I understand that, it's hard to get someone on the phone. People have busy schedules, but, you know, I I do appreciate in those situations too, if I'm reaching out to a law firm or a company and they don't have someone available at that moment to then set up a call for another time, you know, to then, to then get the connection going later on, even if today doesn't work, because those connections are really helpful for the next time I am under a tight deadline. And, you know, I can think of the right person to call for that. I understand that sometimes people aren't available when I need them. That happens every single day. That's why I reach out to a lot of people if I if I need comment under a short deadline. But you know, setting up those relationships and connections is what's really helpful to me and you know, being able to think about these issues. So let's talk about deadlines for a second because I don't think I asked you about that. Do you have actual times of day where you have to submit stories? Or, or like things have to be done at a certain time on certain days? I personally don't. I know that at some news organizations, you know, there are deadlines that are set once you're thinking about a story and they say, you know, have this in by this time. I don't personally have that in my work, in my work day, but I am still trying to write things quickly. So even if someone is not telling me you need to have this in the next hour, you know, I'm still I'm still trying to get it done in the next hour or two. So I'm I'm not working toward a specific time, but I am working under, you know, a a fast paced deadline. So if you have connected with a source and you've given that source the deadline, can you just tell all the sources out there how important it is to respond within deadline? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So yes, responding by the deadline is very helpful because I can't have a story that's sitting waiting for comment for seven hours in the day. Even though someone isn't saying this needs to be published by this time, I'm still expected to have the story done so I can either move on to the next thing or do whatever else is on my plate. So the deadline thing is important. I would say that, you know, we're talking about daily stories here for longer term things and the you know, deadlines or are more flexible. It still does help to you know, to try to get those calls done quickly. You know, even though I'm not operating under a a tight deadline, a one hour deadline, I still, I don't want to call two weeks from now for something I'm working on this week. Well, what's interesting, and I I think we, we tend to forget that you might be working on something for two weeks from now, but another trend might occur or something might happen where that story is relevant today. Yeah. And it's going to get more coverage today. Yeah. So having that information is going to be valuable. And I think that's one of the things we as lawyers tend to forget. Well, this you never know how this is going to play into right. a daily news cycle. Right. Yeah, that's very true. I'd also like to say that, you know, even if someone can't get back to me by the deadline, maybe it won't make it into the story. But I generally am still interested in hearing what they have to say about the topic because it probably won't be the last time that I'm writing about it. So, you know, deadlines are important and, you know, I would like to hear back from someone by the deadline, but, you know, even if I can't talk to them by that time, I I still want to hear their thoughts because it might inform my next story. That actually makes me, begs another question. Do you ever update stories based on new information? 
that would make it more of a, you know, fill in the gaps as you will? Yeah, I, I guess that really, it's kind of a case by case basis. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm writing about, you know, litigation or something that really truly deserves, you know, comment from both sides. I mean, all stories deserve comment from all sides, but, you know, something if you're writing a lawsuit against a company and we publish a story before they had the chance to comment, if they do come back with that comment, we'll update the story because that's just what's right. (laughs) But if it's something more, you know, analysis based or just hearing someone's thoughts, we don't generally or I guess I wouldn't generally update the story if it's just more thoughts from someone, but maybe that'll turn into a, a second day analysis piece. So, you know, that's something that I try to do a lot too. Maybe something happens one day, I write one story about it without, you know, without all of the context that everyone could have to say. But then the next day or a few days later, I'll write something again on that news with, with more comments. So that's always a possibility too. Well, Sarah, I have been so, I mean, intrigued by what you have to say, what you share. You know, I'm involved in all of those aspects of law, privacy and data security and and the business of law. So it's really fun to talk to you about it, learn more about you. I am appreciative of you joining us today, and I'm sure our listeners are as well. How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, so I'd say the best way to get in touch with me is email, Twitter, or LinkedIn. So my email is sarah.merkin at thompsonreuters.com. And my name in, uh, is the same on LinkedIn and Twitter. So those are the best ways to contact me. And for our listeners, I will just say that as a Sarah without an H. S-A-R-A. Yes, without an H. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. <laughs> we have a Sarah Larson who works for us, who's our executive vice president, and she's with an H. So mm. I'm always mindful of that. Well, thank you again. And thank you to our listeners. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of On Record PR and get in touch with Sarah Merkin. Have a great day, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Furia Rubel Communications. Recognized as the number one agency by the National Law Journal, Furia Rubel helps top businesses and law firms with high stakes public relations and marketing, reputation management, crisis planning, and incident response, including high-profile litigation media relations. To learn more, go to furiarubel.com or email podcast at furiarubel.com. Thank you for listening to On Record PR. Visit our website, onrecordpr.com, to subscribe to the show, share it with your friends on social media, find show notes, additional episodes, and more information. We'll see you next time. In the meantime, feel free to send us questions or show ideas at podcast at onrecordpr.com.